Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's really a privilege to be here in Jackson. I told some folks that I think I've been through here at some point when my father threw us all into the car and took us to the national parks, um, but it's been a really long time. Um, I especially want to thank Marsha Britton and the folks she works with both in Laramie and here in Jackson. Um, Jennifer Lee here at the National Museum of Wildlife Art and my own program director, Paul Flesher, both for that lovely introduction and for organizing this event and invited me to participate. So when you hear the word Mormon, what do you think of? Do you think of this guy? <laughs> <laughs> and his photogenic family? Or maybe it's this man, the immediate past president of the LDS Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or the Mormon Church, who appeared on 60 Minutes. Or maybe you think of some different Mormons you saw on TV, in this case, um, a family from South Park. Perhaps your mind goes to some guys who look like this, who maybe rang your doorbell once or twice. Or maybe you think of folks who aren't exactly recognizable, but they look something like this. Lots of blondes, lots of kids. Chances are whoever pops up in your mind when you're asked to think about Mormons, it's someone clean cut, respectable, and white. Now, with its latest advertising campaign, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is trying to change that. In several major cities, though nowhere in Wyoming, friendly faces stare out from billboards and talk to viewers from television screens. The point is simple. Mormons are a diverse bunch. They're not all respectable looking. They write hipster captions for them, themselves. They don't even use um, capital letters sometimes. They're not all married with children. They're not all clean cut. And they're not all white. They're diverse. They're just like you and me, whoever you and I are. This campaign is somewhat confused by the recent Broadway hit, The Book of Mormon. Perhaps you've heard of it. I was talking with a few people about this last night. The show follows two white LDS missionaries from Utah as they attempt to win converts in war-torn Uganda. It won nine Tony Awards, including Best Musical in 2011, and a Grammy in 2012 for Best Musical Theater Album. The LDS Church's reaction to the musical has been muted. Pressed to comment, the church official issued an official statement of only one sentence. Clearly, they didn't have an academic working for them. Unofficial reaction has been mixed. For the most part, prominent Mormon voices were careful not to be too defensive, attempting to express appreciation for the mostly sympathetic depiction while correcting what they saw as the inaccuracies of the show. One of the musical's most popular songs, I Believe, was showcased at the Tony Awards ceremony in 2011. The song, a pan to unquestioning faith, articulates some of the more, more esoteric elements of the LDS religion, including one verse directed squarely at a warlord pictured here, um, that the singing missionary hopes to convert. And this sounds, I will say, a lot better in the song than it does when I just read the lyric. The lyric goes, and I believe that in 1978, God changed his mind about black people. You can be a Mormon. The lyric refers to that revelation that Jerry Parkinson talked about earlier, received by a church president in 1978, extending the LDS priesthood to quote, all worthy male members of the church. That revelation, now included in the LDS scriptures as official declaration too, ended more than a century of exclusion for Mormons of black African descent who, although they could be baptized in the faith, were not allowed to hold the priesthood or participate in temple ceremonies because of their race. So the thousands of people who have memorized these lyrics could be forgiven for thinking that the Mormon church was a lily white place until that 1978 revelation that those early images we started out with today are an accurate reflection of the LDS church and its history. What all this obscures, both the musical and the church's own ad campaign, I think, 
is that there is a longer history of non-white Mormons stretching all the way back to the church's first decade. So the book that I'm working on now, even though Paul thinks I'm not working on it, um, <laughs> is called Marginal Mormons, and that it unlocks that history. I'm analyzing the religious experiences of African American and Native American Mormons in the 19th century in order to understand the relationship between racial identity and religious experience. Now, the first question I usually get when I tell someone I'm working on this topic, where's Pete Jorgensen? There he is in the back. He asked me that tonight, last night, was, were there any? Were there any black or Native American Mormons in the 19th century? Were there any before 1978? Now, the short answer, of course, is yes. Otherwise, it would be a very short book. <laughs> How many? Well, that's a little harder to say. My best guess right now is that there were at least several hundred African American Mormons and several times that number of Native Americans in the church. Black and Native American Mormons held diametrically opposed positions in LDS cosmology in the 19th century. White Mormons in the 19th century, and to a somewhat lesser extent even today, believed that Native Americans were Lamanites. The name comes from the Book of Mormon, the book, not the musical, and it refers to the descendants of Laman, one of the patriarchs of the narrative. According to the Book of Mormon, Laman's father was Lehi, a Jew, who, following God's guidance, built a boat and sailed to America, where he and his sons settled in about 600 before the Common Era. Thus, according to Mormon belief, Laman and his descendants were Jews. Although, as far as the Mormons could tell, the Native Americans had completely forgotten that heritage. Nevertheless, that heritage made them extremely desirable converts, because as the Mormons read the Bible, the Jews all had to be converted before the second coming of Jesus could take place. So missions to Native Americans, or Lamanites, were a necessary step in bringing about the millennium. Now, on the ground, this cosmology played out a little bit differently. Although the Mormons sent missionaries to various Indian tribes, almost immediately after organizing their church in 1830. Evangelistic successes were rare until later in the 19th century. Perhaps the Mormons' most notable success came on the Catawba Reservation in South Carolina, where virtually the entire Catawba tribe converted to Mormonism in 1883. The Baptist missionaries there were not pleased. To this day, the majority of Catawbas remain members of the LDS Church. Elsewhere, missionaries baptized hundreds of Shoshone Indians and recorded Paiute Indians' visions confirming the truth of the LDS Church. But the Mormons also got into plenty of fights with Native Americans, particularly once the saints started settling in Utah. These tense relations sometimes led Mormons to wonder whether the Native Americans still were God's chosen people. They didn't wonder about African Americans. Like many 19th century white Americans, white Mormons explained African Americans' dark skin as the physical evidence that blacks were descended from Cain, the biblical first murderer, or from Noah's son Ham, whose son Canaan Noah cursed to be a servant of servants. For most white Americans, this talk of curses and biblical lineages justified a generalized prejudice against, Native, or against African Americans. And we see this prejudice in some of Mormon founder Joseph Smith's statements. Smith was a fairly enlightened figure on the topic of race for his time and place. But he was also difficult to pin down. He opposed slavery, but he thought those pushing for immediate abolition were too radical. He talked about the intellectual equality of blacks and whites, but he absolutely opposed interracial marriage. A few African American men were ordained to the priesthood during Joseph Smith's lifetime, apparently with his full knowledge and consent. After his death in 1844, though, the existing racial prejudice in the LDS Church, along with the explanation of blacks' racial origins in a biblical curse, 
crystallized a specific set of restrictions, generally known as the priesthood ban or the priesthood restriction. Unlike many religious organizations, Mormonism has no specially trained clergy. Instead, all worthy Mormon men are ordained to the priesthood. But while the priesthood ban was in effect, Mormon leaders refused to allow black men to be ordained. As a corollary, black women could not enjoy what are known as the blessings of the priesthood, access to the supernatural power that the priesthood conferred. This meant that black men and women, unlike other Mormon men and women, could not participate in the temple ceremonies that Mormons believed were necessary to reach the highest degrees of glory after death. And this state of affairs lasted until 1978, when a new revelation extended the LDS priesthood to all worthy male members of the church. So that's the revelation that the song from the Book of Mormon musical was referring to with the lyric, in 1978, God changed his mind about black people. Now, despite the priesthood ban, black people continued to join the church during the 19th century. And those who had joined during Joseph Smith's lifetime, some of them at least, remained members of the church. We don't know all their names. Sometimes all we have is something like this, a photo of the first branch conference in Sanderson, Florida in, 19, in 1897, with a knot of black people down there in the right-hand corner. It's important to note that the priesthood ban was an obvious way of creating a racial hierarchy within the LDS church, but it certainly wasn't the only way of doing that. Mormons mobilized the resources of whiteness and of Americanness to establish a racial hierarchy and their place at its pinnacle in all sorts of ways, some more subtle than others. In the end, it boiled down to this. White male Mormons who held the priesthood controlled entry into the group through baptism and advancement within the group through ordination to the priesthood, participation in various rituals, and callings to church positions. Those who did not respect the racial hierarchy were drummed out in short order. Those who performed their racial role appropriately were allowed to stay. Now it's difficult, if not impossible, to say how non-white Mormons experienced the imposition of this racial hierarchy. For example, as I mentioned, the Catawba Indians of South Carolina all converted to Mormonism in 1883, defying those Baptist missionaries who were already on the Catawba reservation. Since several Mormon missionaries had been physically attacked in the South in the preceding years, it's difficult to imagine that the Catawbas were betting on Mormonism as a path to greater social respectability or equality in South Carolina. However, they may have seen the LDS Church as a place where they would experience a measure of equality with their white co-religionists. So they would all be Mormons, they would all be attacked in South Carolina together, but at least the Indians would be equal to some white people within the church. As I mentioned earlier, a majority of Catawbas remain Mormon to this day, suggesting that they found ways to reimagine the racial hierarchies that cast them as second-class citizens within the church, or that they simply didn't experience themselves in that manner to begin with. So, if the first question I get is, when I tell someone about this research project, is were there any black or Native American Mormons in the 19th century? And the second question is, how many? The third and most difficult question, which I also got at dinner last night, um, was why did they join the LDS Church? And why did they stay Mormons? And these, of course, are the very questions I'm trying to answer in my book. The conclusion that I'm coming to is that black and Native American Mormons constructed their Mormon identities in ways that were different from what we might expect. They built on experiences that were beyond the control of the church hierarchy, drawing on Mormonism's radically democratic sense that God could and did speak to and through ordinary individuals to create alternative Mormon identities that they found spiritually compelling. So today I want to focus on just a couple of stories to help make this point. The first is about a man named Torbuka and a group of Goshute Indians. The Goshutes lived in the Great Basin, southwest of the Great Salt Lake. 
1875, an article published in the Latter-day Saints Millennial Star, an LDS periodical published in Britain and circulated among Mormons in both the United States and the United Kingdom, recounted the baptisms of Torbuka and about 100 Goshute Indians, among whom, according to the article, Torbuka was a leading chief. Now, I should note that this account comes to us several times removed from its original telling. Torbuka told it to the man who baptized him, William Lee, and Elder Lee told it to a guy named John Nicholson. Nicholson wrote an article that appeared in the Juvenile Instructor, another LDS publication printed in Salt Lake. And then that article was reprinted in the Millennial Star. So acknowledging the layers of discourse here, let me sketch out the story. Torbuka and some part of his band were camped west of Deep Creek in the spring of 1874. So this is western Utah, almost in Nevada. One night, Torbuka had a dream. He thought he saw a beautiful meadow through which flowed a fine stream of clear water, Nicholson wrote. He thought he saw Elder Lee, who told him that himself and his people must wash in the stream. So when Torbuka woke up, he went with his people to wash in a creek that was nearby. Later on, sitting alone in his tent, Torbuka was visited by a handsome, gray-bearded man. Nicholson writes that Torbuka, quote, gazed at this personage for a few moments when he, the stranger, addressed Torbuka, the substance of his words being that the time had come for the Indians to be buried in water, baptized, that the Mormons were their friends, that they had a book which told about their fathers, that Brigham Young held communion with God, and they must hear him. He also told Torbuka that the enemies of the Indians had driven, robbed, plundered and abused them, but that the time when their enemies could do that was nearly past, that the time had almost arrived when those who had wronged them would be like the dry wood upon the mountains that would be consumed and they, the Indians, would walk over the ashes." Unquote. The visitor then left the tent and disappeared. Two more personages later visited Torbuka, together this time, and repeated what the first visitor had said. These two also left the same way, apparently disappearing into thin air. Finally, one of them came back for a third visitation and repeated again what had already been said. Torbuka had gotten the point. He gathered as many people as he could and set out for Deep Creek. Once he got there, he sent a message to William Lee, the elder who had appeared in Torbuka's original dream. Torbuka was probably already acquainted with Lee because Lee had worked for several years on behalf of the Goshute Indians. Lee met Torbuka and the Goshutes, and Nicholson tells us, preached the gospel to them, explaining the principles thereof in as simple a manner as he could to meet their capacities. Then, Lee and the Mormon men who accompanied him baptized as many as wanted to be baptized, which was apparently pretty much everyone. Nicholson notes as well that, quote, besides the baptizing and confirming of over a hundred of those people, seven of the most intelligent of the men were ordained elders and instructed in the duties of the calling of that office. And subsequent events give every indication that they have been very industrious and zealous in telling their brethren in, ver in, telling their brethren in various parts of the things that they had received. So let's add some historical context to this story. That's what I do, after all, I'm an academic. As I said earlier, the Goshutes lived in the southwestern part of the Great Basin. Goshutes are part of the Newa, the Shoshonean-speaking peoples of the Intermountain West. Culturally, then, they share much with other Indian groups in the area, the Utes, the Paiutes, the Shoshones, the Bannocks, and others. When the Mormons emigrated to the Great Basin in 1847, things started to get difficult. Suddenly, a very fragile environment had to support a much larger human population. White settlers' livestock destroyed Goshutes' food sources. Water was quickly in short supply. The Goshutes responded by killing livestock and threatening settlers, trying to drive them out. In an attempt to ameliorate the situation, the government established a farm at Deep Creek, the same place where Torbuka and his band were baptized in the 1850s. 
It seemed to be going well, but the government abandoned the project shortly after the agent who established the farm resigned at the end of the decade. Instead, the Goshutes themselves were eventually forced to sign a treaty in 1863. The terms of the treaty allowed the construction of telegraph lines, railways, and stage lines through Goshute territory. It also allowed white settlers to cut timber, build mills, dig mines, and maintain ranches in the area. In return, the federal government would pay the Goshutes $1,000 a year for 20 years. Predictably, the government annuities were both insufficient for the Goshutes' survival, and they were cut off long before the 20 years had elapsed. Nevertheless, the Goshutes moved to adopt an agricultural lifestyle, settling on farms at Deep Creek and in Skull Valley. In Skull Valley, a farmer named William Lee, who might sound familiar by now, helped the Goshutes get their farms going. Lee gained the trust of the Skull Valley Band and ultimately acted as a spokesperson for them in their ongoing negotiations with the government in the 1870s. The federal government kept trying to get the Goshutes to relocate to a reservation, and the Goshutes kept refusing. As white encroachment continued, the Goshutes just faded into the background, becoming invisible even to the whites who occupied their lands. So one way to understand the subsequent Mormonism of Torbuka and the Deep Creek Goshutes is that this was a calculated ploy to enlist the, insistence, enlist the, insi the assistance of white Mormons in the face of an untenable situation. Things with the federal government clearly weren't going right. The Goshutes had switched to agricultural subsistence methods, but they needed further help. Accepting LDS baptism might be a way of mobilizing resources and present, preventing starvation. Spring, planting time, would be the right time, even though that water must have been awfully cold. But maybe there's something more going on here. Let's look back at the story and dig even a little deeper. First, Torbuka has a dream and the people wash in the creek. In Newa tradition, unsolicited dreams were the most effective way of acquiring spiritual power. So Torbuka already had a religious framework in which to make sense of this dream. If we place this dream within that framework, then Elder Lee, the guy who appears in the dream and tells Torbuka to take his people to go wash in the stream, becomes a spirit tutor, a bearer of supernatural power. Spirit tutors frequently gave their pupils very specific instructions about how to dress, how to behave, and so on. So this instruction to wash is not all that surprising. Newa shamans frequently painted themselves following the directions of their spirit tutors. The only difference here was that Torbuka and his band were essentially unpainting themselves. This move was consistent with what the elderly probably said in the flesh. Mormons were constantly after the Indians to stop painting themselves. Indeed, in the second part of his article, John Nicholson told his readers that, quote, Almost the first question asked of the elders by those Lamanites who were baptized was, what can we do to be independent? We wish to support ourselves and be like the white people, unquote. The elders responded that the Indians should lay off the alcohol and that, quote, it was better to wash their faces and keep them clean than to paint them. And many have ceased to, to use paint, unquote. Now, after the washing, the visitations begin. Three visitors, arriving and departing, alone or in pairs. These figures, even more than the dream state Elder Lee, are clearly spirit tutors, instructing Torbuka. They all bear the same message. It's time for the Goshutes to get baptized. The Mormons are allies. The Book of Mormon contains a history of the Goshutes. God communicates directly with Brigham Young, and the Goshutes should listen to Brigham Young. And finally, the time was coming when the Goshutes enemies would be destroyed. So both Elder Lee and Brigham Young figure here as LDS authority figures. In Torbuka's dream, Lee tells him that he and his people must wash in the stream. But from the account we have, it appears that Torbuka took this as a suggestion. He woke with, quote, very pleasant feelings, and as there was a creek nearby, he told his people they must go and wash themselves in it, unquote. Had Torbuka woken with 
a less positive outlook on life, or had the creek been an inconvenient distance away, we get the sense from this telling that he might not have complied with Lee's direction, or at least that he would have done so under considerably more duress. It's possible that this casual approach to Lee's dream instructions is an artifact of Nicholson's er, narration, but I would suggest that either way, Lee's authority here derives less from his status as a Mormon priesthood holder and more from the fact that he gave these instructions to Torbuka in a dream, thus taking on the character of a spirit tutor in Gashu culture. Brigham Young, likewise, seems to have some authority. After all, Torbuka's visitors tell him that Young communicates directly with God and that Torbuka and his people should listen to Young. But Young's authority, like Lee's, is constructed by the medium through which it is communicated. Had Young shown up at Deep Creek in the flesh and told the Indians that he talked to God, it's unlikely that anyone would have taken him seriously at least until he demonstrated an ability to control the weather or cure disease. Since the spirit tutors testify to his authority, though, Young's status is beyond question. But it's also worth noting that through his spirit tutors, Torbuka himself has a line of communication with God as well. Now, I find the last part of the visitor's spiel particularly striking. The visitors, quote, told Torbuka that the enemies of the Indians had driven, robbed, plundered, and abused them, but that the time when their enemies could do that was nearly past, that the time had almost arrived when those who had wronged them would be like the dry wood upon the mountains that would be consumed, and they, the Indians, would walk over the ashes, unquote. It's not hard to guess who the enemies of the Indians are in this formulation. The federal government and its Indian agents had reneged on treaties and killed native people. White settlers had driven the Goshutes off their land, ruined their food supplies, and essentially made it impossible for the Goshutes to follow their traditional lifeways. Torbuka's visitors thus articulate a millennialist vision, a belief in the imminent end of the world as we know it, that Torbuka and the other Goshutes would have found particularly attractive. That millennialism was consistent with Mormonism, which expected the second coming to occur at any moment. But it was also a common feature of other religious movements among native peoples in the Great Basin around the same time. The most famous of these is the Ghost Dance Movement, which had taken a f hold a few years before Torbuka's visitations. Greg Smoke, who's a historian down at CU Boulder, writes that Ghost Dance prophets quote, returned from the land of the dead with a message of identity and community healing. Ghost dances were a community curing rite that promised the restoration of a world free of disease, death, and spiritual disharmony, unquote. So what I'm suggesting here is that Torbuka received roughly the same message, only instead of the ghost dance, Mormonism was the vehicle by which the Goshutes would arrive in that restored world. That millennial vision is less clear on the ultimate relationship between the Indians and the Mormons. But within the visitor's instructions, the Indians are always kept separate from the Mormons. The Mormons are cast as the Indians' friends, not as the people the Indians would become. The Indians are the ones who will have revenge on their enemies, and though it looks like the Mormons are not a part of that group that would be like the dry wood on the mountains that would be consumed, the enemies of the Mormons are left out entirely here. So in Torbuka's vision, we catch a glimpse of a triumphant Indian identity, bolstered by, but not entirely dependent upon, white Mormons, constructed from Mormonism, but congruent with Gashu culture and religion as well. Now, I wish I could tell you how the story played out, whether Torbuka's band remained Mormons, whether they were among the Indians who went through the LDS temple, receiving their endowments and being sealed in eternal marriages. Unfortunately, the evidence is fragmentary. And if that part of the story was documented, I haven't found it yet. Still, I think the story is a useful one in understanding how Native Americans of various tribal affiliations might have constructed Mormon identities. Torbuka's dream and vision fit well within a Mormon framework. Later in his account, John Nicholson even ventures to guess 
that Torbuka's visitors, those three guys, um, were the three Nephites, a trio of men from the Book of Mormon who were promised that they would not taste death before Jesus returned. And there's lots of Mormon folklore about the three Nephites wandering around and helping out stranded motorists and that sort of thing. But Torbuka's experience also fit within a traditional Goshute and more broadly Newa framework. Now the documentation on African American Mormons is just as fragmentary. However, there is one woman who left a relatively robust paper trail at her death. Her name was Jane Elizabeth Manning James. James was born Jane Elizabeth Manning, a free black child in southwest, southwestern Connecticut in the first part of the 19th century. As a young woman in the winter of 1842 to 43, she converted to Mormonism. And later that year, she traveled with her family and several other converts to Nauvoo, Illinois, where the LDS church was then based and where she met and married another black convert, Isaac James. She worked as a servant in Joseph Smith's home and after his death in 1844 in Brigham Young's home. She was in one of the first companies to reach the Salt Lake Valley and she remained a faithful Mormon until her death in 1908. We know more about Jane James than we do about most 19th century black Mormons because James left a comparative wealth of documentation behind at her death petitions for permission to participate in temple ceremonies, an interview with the LDS periodical Young Woman's Journal, and even a short autobiography. She also appeared occasionally in other LDS print publications like the Deseret News, the local newspaper in Salt Lake, and the Woman's Exponent, the periodical published by the LDS women's organization known as the Relief Society. Those documents show how James constructed her identity as a Mormon, even though the priesthood and temple restrictions meant that she could not participate in temple ceremonies that Mormons believed were necessary to reach the highest degrees of glory after death. In the documents she left, James talked about a variety of religious experiences, including speaking in tongues, dreams and visions, and faith healings. These experiences were some of the raw materials James used to build her sense of herself as a Mormon. James's first experience with glossolalia, the gift of tongues, came quote, about three weeks after her baptism while kneeling at prayer, she remembered. As James told it, quote, the gift of tongues came upon me and threatened the whole family who were in the, the next room, unquote. Speaking in tongues was common for Latter-day Saints in the 19th century, though church leaders cautioned members against basing doctrine on the messages received through those who spoke in tongues. This encounter with the Holy Spirit was not an isolated experience for James. She spoke in tongues fairly frequently later in her life, as the minutes of retrenchment society meetings document. By then an elderly woman living in Salt Lake, James regularly attended and participated in meetings of this women's organization, itself a subsidiary of the Relief Society, which was the main women's auxiliary in the church and the counterpart to the LDS priesthood. Many of the women, both leaders and ordinary folks, spoke in tongues at meetings, so James wasn't unusual. From what we can tell from the minutes, James's outbursts in tongues were sometimes interpreted and sometimes they weren't, just like they were for other women. According to the accounts we have, James had visions or dreams less frequently. In an interview, James recalled that she, before she ever laid eyes on Joseph Smith, quote, I saw him back in old Connecticut so, in a vision, saw him plain, and knew he was a prophet, unquote. So this vision, which functioned as a sort of continuation of the divine human connection established in James's first experience with glossolalia, further confirmed James's decision to join the LDS Church and bolstered Joseph Smith's prophetic authority. But James's connection with the divine could also undermine the, the authority of church leaders. James dictated her autobiography after decades of petitioning church leaders unsuccessfully for permission to go to the temple and receive her endowments. The endowment is essentially an initiation ritual in which participants receive sacred knowledge and make certain promises, preparing them to ascend to higher degrees of glory after death. It is in the endowment ritual that Mormons receive sacred garments, 
that are then worn under their clothes on a daily basis, reminding the initiates of their sacred identity and the promises they made. So these are the uh, special underwear, Mormon underwear, that outsiders love to talk about. Initiates also receive a new name, which is used only in certain sacred contexts, contexts and otherwise not revealed. The endowment ceremony was still under development when James worked for Joseph Smith as a servant. When James talked about that period years later, though, she recalled that one of her first tasks in her new job was to do the laundry. Quote, among the clothes, I found Brother Joseph's robes, she said. Now, to clarify, these were not the underwear, but rather outer garments that would have been worn in the temple for the performance of sacred ceremonies like the endowment. James went on, quote, I looked at the robes and wondered. I had never seen any before. And her wonder was so profound that it led to a mystical experience. Quote, I pondered over them and thought about them so earnestly that the spirit made manifest to me that they pertain to the new name that is given the saints that the world knows not of. I didn't know when I washed them or when I put them out to dry, unquote. So as James indicated, the world knew not about this new name because the Mormons closely guarded information about their temple rituals. This knowledge then was privileged information about sacred rites that the Holy Spirit had apparently seen fit to share directly with James. In the end, James seemed to be saying, church leaders could try all they wanted to shut her out of the temple. God would still fill her in on the details. James's accounts of healings also had that destabilizing effect. In 1896, the secretary of the Retrenchment Society recorded in the meeting minutes that, quote, Sister James bore a faithful testimony and said she had been terribly afflicted in the head, and she took her consecrated oil and anointed herself, and she was healed, felt that that was faith, and praised the Lord for her blessings, unquote. James made a similar remark when she dictated her autobiography some years later. Recounting her journey to join the Mormons in Nauvoo, Illinois, she recalled, quote, at La Harp we came to a place where there was a very sick child. We administered to it and the child was healed. I found after the elders, guys who held the LDS priesthood, had before this given it up as they did not think it could live, unquote. Now, James's claims of healing ability are notable here, particularly because women's authority to heal had become the subject of intense debate in the LDS church by the end of the 19th century. Throughout the early history of the church, leaders encouraged women to perform healing rituals, especially for other women and for children. By the end of the century, though, church leaders had repositioned women's healing authority, clearly subordinating it to that of priesthood holders, who alone could seal the anointing and blessing. The debate over women's healing activities lasted decades. And James may have seen these statements as a contribution to that discussion. Still, it's hard not to read them as a jab at priesthood holders and the church hierarchy more generally. James healed herself, and she healed a child that the elders had given up on. Who needs the priesthood? when you can heal more effectively without it. James was not allowed to receive her endowments or be sealed in marriage during her lifetime. And that exclusion clearly troubled her. However, even without access to those temple ceremonies, which one scholar has described as, quote, the privileged source of LDS truth, unquote, James still constructed herself as an insider. She was Mormon through and through. But James constructed that identity using materials, religious experiences that were beyond the control of the church leaders. She relied on tongues for a sense of divine connection, on visions for sacred information, and on healings for divine approval of her faith. Like Torbuka, who recognized the authority of Brigham Young and other Mormons, James submitted to the authority of the LDS priesthood, but neither James nor Torbuka thought those human priesthood holders were the only path to God. Neither one of them depended on the priesthood holders to provide the experiences out of which to construct a sense of self as Mormon. 
So if the I am a Mormon campaign had been around during their lifetimes, both James and Torbuka might have joined 21st century Mormons in contributing their own profiles. But their self-introductions might give us a different idea of what it means to be Mormon. Maybe it means finding a personal, supernatural connection to God that bypasses the church hierarchy. Maybe it means finding an ancestral connection to the Book of Mormon. Maybe being a Mormon, at least for some 19th century Mormons, has nothing to do with priesthood or temple rituals or garments or callings. Now, why does this matter? Why bother with the stories of these tiny little minorities in what was, at the time, a tiny little minority religion? Is there anything worthwhile here beyond satisfying an antiquarian curiosity, which I'm totally in favor of, um, or perhaps a devotional need? I think the answer is a resounding yes. The stories of Jane James and Torbuka and other black and Native American Mormons force us to reckon with the relationship between race and religion, and in the process to write a new story of Mormon history. This is not the standard story of Mormonism, in which everyone is white, nor is it a happy multicultural story of Mormonism, in which everyone lives and works together in racial harmony, and the cast of characters looks like a Benetton ad. Instead, it's the story of the formation of a religion and the simultaneous construction of its adherent, adherence identities through a complex, messy, and often inconsistent process of inclusion, exclusion, and ranking that resulted in the construction of multiple ways of being Mormon, multiple meanings for that religious identity, all of them shaped by racial and ethnic identities. African American and Native American Mormons' religious experiences centered not on temple rituals and priesthood, but on other experiences, healings, visions, tongues, that were less easily controlled by church leaders. So focusing on racial ethnic minorities helps us get away from the institutional and elite history that has dominated Mormon studies to think about the lived religion of ordinary people. Thinking about Jane James and Trabuca then, reminds us that Mormonism is a religion with a relatively short but deeply complicated history, not a faith we can glibly dismiss with a joke about polygamy or special underwear. We are also reminded that racial and ethnic identities can play a powerful role in shaping religious experiences. The story that Torbuka told to women, William Lee held deep meaning for both men, but Torbuka's framework for making sense of his experiences, shaped as it was by Gashu culture, was very different from Lee's. The largely white LDS readership that learned Torbuka's story in the pages of the juvenile instructor or the millennial star drew a very different meaning from it than Torbuka himself probably did. So while all of these folks might say, I'm a Mormon, they are joined by people of other racial backgrounds who make the same affirmation, an affirmation in which Jane James and Torbuka would also have joined. And for each of them, the white Mormons, as much as the Mormons of color, the identity that statement affirms is shaped not only by their Mormonism, but also by their racial identities, which in every century have closed some doors and opened others. They might all say that they're Mormons, but that statement means something different in each of their lives. And it's up to us, as people interested in the human experience, to find out what exactly it does mean. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dool. We actually have some time for questions. So anybody would like to address a question for Dr. Dool? Yeah. You did mention Chief Washakie. I had heard that he was baptized Mormon. He was, in fact, baptized Mormon, yeah. I, I mean, I could talk about lots of folks, right? Um, but I think Torbuka's story is really interesting, so I focused on him. But yes, Chief Washakie and lots of Shoshones were baptized Mormon as well. Yeah. So how does the experience of 
was, was that an anomaly, or did a lot of things like that happen in a different context? That's a great question. Um, so we have this really long history of Protestant and Catholic missionaries in the West long before Mormons get there. And we have lots of information about what's going on. Um, so it's hard to boil it down that much. Um, but I think Mormons have a slightly different relationship with Native Americans because they see them as um, essentially as Jews. Right? So that's one thing that's shaping things slightly differently. Um, do we get these sort of productive, excuse me, productive misunderstandings in Protestant and Catholic context? Absolutely. Um, I think you can look, for example, at um, Mission San Francisco in California. I'm, I'm cheating, drawing on my previous work. Um, and if you look at the way the sanctuary is, is decorated at Mission San Francisco, it was built and decorated by Native Americans. And you look at the geometric designs and they look a whole lot like basketry designs, which carried spiritual meaning. And so I think what's going on there is that Native Americans are importing their own um, understandings of the spiritual world into Catholicism in interesting kinds of ways and misunderstanding Catholicism or at least misunderstanding what the priests want them to understand um, in ways that make Catholicism maybe a little more amenable to their own outlooks. Um, so I don't think that what Torbuka is doing is really all that unusual, um, but I do think that Mormon missionaries tended, tended to be slightly more open to Native American expressions of spirituality because they, they were sort of set up to look for evidence of the divine outside of their faith um, in early Mormonism. And they saw this, the ghost dance phenomenon in the West as an indication that the end times were coming really soon. Um, so they, they sort of, there was productive misunderstanding, I think, on both sides. Yeah. yeah. Regarding the overall composition of the Church of Latter-day Saints, do we you know what the percentage is uh, in the United States versus in the rest of the world outside of the United States? What the racial composition is? Uh, racial whatever. I mean, they could be the same or a different race. But sure. In terms of U.S. versus mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Okay, so how does, how does membership in the United States stack up against outside? There are more Mormons outside the United States than there are inside the United States at this point. Um, the LDS Church is rapidly becoming very brown, um, and that is going to be a challenge for the church, I think, going forward, because the leadership is still very white. Um, so in terms of sort of racial hierarchies, they've got a lot to wrestle with. So the missionary element of this church is quite successful. <laughs> that is a much more difficult question, actually. Um, most missionaries don't convert many people. Um, and when we're talking about missionaries, we're talking mostly about roughly 19-year-old boys, right? Um, we know that the missionary program is wildly successful in socializing the men of the church. It teaches them to work together. It teaches them to be committed to the church. It gives them a testimony in ways that they don't, they, they just can't get otherwise. Um, so it's very successful in getting kids committed to the church. Um, they rarely perform very many baptisms. Um, the LDS church seems to spread more along family lines. Um, and so it's not necessarily the missionaries themselves who are doing the missionizing, really. It's, members of your own family who get baptized and then say, oh really, you know, you should join me and, um, and people find it persuasive in that way, right? So the idea here is every member a missionary, that, that was the slogan for a long time, right? Um, and so in that sense, sure, the missionary program is very successful. Um, in the sense of the, the formal missionary program where you've got 19 year old boys knocking on your door, that is not a particularly effective piece for converting people. Um, so, yeah. What do you think women stand in the future of uh, priesthood, LDS, or in Catholicism, or in Orthodox Judaism? Because uh, they're more equivalent to blacks and Indians. Sorry. <laughs> Is it Yogi Berra who said predictions are dangerous, especially about the future? <laughs> um, um, 
the role of women in the LDS church is, um, a, again, a very complicated one. Um, and there, are, there is a feminist movement within the LDS church. Um, a few months ago it was uh, Wear Pants to Church Day. Um, some of you may have heard about this. As a way of sort of talking about sort of what role do women play and what's cultural and what's religious about that. Um, will women ever hold the priesthood in the LDS church? I, I don't know. Um, certainly some women want to. Lots of women have no interest in that. Um, can the LDS church find ways to um, make women feel and, and really sort of incorporate women in a more egalitarian way without giving them the priesthood? Absolutely. I mean, there are ways that they could do that. Um, what's going to happen 50 or 100 years from now? We'll see. You and me and Yogi Berra. Right? <laughs>